you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 13 vampiric clans in this world of darkness. This episode will focus on the Clan of the Rose, Clan Toreador. I have not shied away from my annoyance concerning the divas during our discussions, partly because of how they treat members of the Nosferatu, and partly because of the arrogance they wear as proudly as their in-season dresses and tuxedos. The Toreador are a clan known for being some of the most beautiful, sensual, seductive, emotional, and glamorous of kindred. They are responsible for the legends of vampires who seduce and entice their prey with beauty, love, and sensuality which I believe is just as bad as it is good. But putting my grievances aside, I have to admit that the Harlots are an exceptionally important clan when it comes to establishing modern kindred society. But to understand that, one must start at the beginning, which again takes us to the era of antediluvians. Many Canite scholars have spent many nights fighting over the name of said antediluvian. Some texts would suggest that the antediluvian was Ishtar, the bull dancer who entranced Enoch with her grace and bravery, whilst other texts suggest that she was actually a he. Many of us refer to her as Arakel, who was a radiant sculptor. I am entitled to believe that Arakel may well have been athletic and artistic, as one does not exclude the other. I am also going to assume that Arakel is a female, as that is the most accepted theory concerning her estrogen and testosterone balance. Enoch and his father ruled the first city during a time where Canites and Kine lived in relative harmony. Enoch was captivated by Arakel and her twin brother, whose name has been lost to time. Arakel would paint and sculpt Enoch, whilst Enoch would discuss poetry and philosophy with the twin. I like to believe that this twin was Malkav, as art has often been closely stalked by madness. Enoch would embrace both of them against Cain's wishes. Cain decided that his descendants, Enoch, Irad, Zilla, and the other second-generation Cainites, were unable to sire anymore, and they listened for a time. The Deluge, otherwise known as the Great Flood, washed the city of Ubar away. Cain interpreted this as another punishment from God and sought to hide away from humanity completely. The third generation was left with their sires, twelve of which wanted to embrace their own childer. When the second generation said no, the third generation did so anyway, rising up and destroying their sires. Cain would naturally catch wind of this and he would return, seeing and hearing his child are destroyed, punishing the antediluvians with the clan curses that would be passed down from childer to childer. The one remaining antediluvian was Arakel, who ran, taking the taste of humane beauty with her which would become a clan weakness in its own right. The Clan of the Rose is just as much a prisoner of their artistic vision and sensitivity as they are its practitioners. They are often overcome by the beauty they see around them and can become immobilized with fascination. Some are repulsed by being in less beautiful surroundings. This of course varies from Toreador to Toreador. After all, how does one define art exactly? Keep that question in mind as I carry on with this story. Arakel travelled the world, engaging combat with the Gangrel Antediluvian, and doing her best to avoid her cousins. She would sire Minos, the King of Crete, who would be diabolized by one childer, Helena, one of the more powerful and infamous Methuselahs active in the modern nights. Arakel would settle in Mycenae, in Greece, seeking affection from King Amphion, his kingdom, and fourteen children. As smitten as he was with her, Arakel's mastery of the presence discipline did not work as it was intended to, as he refused to leave his children. Arakel, not taking rejection so well, embraced him anyway, and slaughtered his children. Just like the kindred before them, the many Methuselahs would fight amongst themselves for power. Arakel would flee once more, with more and more Toreador populating each nation, all toughened by their experiences. There is evidence to suggest that Tanit, a child of Arakel, who was embraced for her beauty, was in a relationship with Troil, the Brujar progenitor. This is only worth mentioning, 
for it would explain where the rebels learned their art of shaping emotion and the passion in which they have in delivering it. In Rome, the Toreadors began to form their relationship with the Ventru, only because the Ventru didn't see them as a threat to their power. Both clans are also natural masters of manipulation and each picked up on the other's flaws. The Toreadors encouraged the joys and splendors of beauty, art and architecture, whilst the Ventru encouraged infrastructure and all of the manifestations of the form. The efforts of the Blue Bloods and perverts made Rome the center of culture and learning. That is not to say that they always saw eye to eye, as the Venture became obsessed with their rivalry against the Bruja, resulting in the war for Carthage, which the Toreador wanted no part of. Such obsession meant that the Kindred paid little attention to the rise of a little cult that would be known as Christianity, burning away much of their progress and our kind. The Venture were stubborn though, as they remained in Rome, whilst many of the Toreador expanded once more, claiming Byzantium and a lot of Africa as their own. You may think the Toreadors cowards for their constant fleeing and populating. The far right may even call it scandalous. It is one Toreador behavioural trait I applaud, especially with the case for Rome, for many of the Venture that remained there were obliterated by the invading Gangrel, Bruja and Zemitsi. They were wise for leaving, and I'm a huge fan of spreading culture and introducing diversity wherever possible. It is how we learn and the world works after all. But I digress. Not a lot of information has been collected regarding the Toreador activities during the Dark Ages, probably because a few of them wanted to hang around in the plague-infested Europe and were just too repulsed to do anything about it. Many hid within the safe walls of the Christian church or castles, where they didn't have to worry about how the real people went about their lives. That is not to say that progress was not being made in and outside of Europe. There was Selenia and a Courts of Love in Paris, which was a social movement that could be best described as canines playing chivalry in courtly love. As previously mentioned, many had moved to the Byzantium and Africa to spread their love for art and culture as well as learning as much as they could about the art and culture of their natives. Nigeria was the centre of Toreador culture well up until the 1980s I'm told. Part of the reason for the Toreador's alignment with the church was because of spiritual pursuit. They have access to the Auspex discipline, granting them the mystical sixth sense to hear and see things that the average naked eye cannot. This would become a slight problem when the church decided to purge such heretics from the world. These artisans would actually encourage this behaviour, nurturing and aiding the church to develop a sect within the church called the Inquisition. You know, the Inquisition that killed many of our kind, burning and staking us out to the sun? Yes, that Inquisition. Many elders of the clan celebrate this, for it led to a complete rebirth of reason and culture, as it would lead to the Convention of Fawns and to the establishing of the Camarilla, setting aside the Jihad, if not addressing the issue that brought upon such a meeting. The Clan of the Rose were perhaps the most important asset concerning the formation of the Camarilla. They bought diplomacy and the masquerade, with a Raphael de Corrosion convincing the Ivory Tower to actually implement it. As you could tell, the Renaissance was arguably the golden age for the clan, who were now the most powerful clan within Europe. They prospered in France as Europe's cultural nexus, enjoying the works of various new artists like Michelangelo and Da Vinci, as well as the works of Shakespeare. There was also the development of opera, large-scale works of music with virtuosic singing like nothing before it. What? Because I am a Nosferatu, I cannot appreciate music. There was also the invention of the mirror, which you can imagine was considered a gift from the gods to many a Toreador. Many Toreadors began to turn away from spiritually motivated preservation to a self-serving hedonism that plagues them today. Not all the degenerates were so progressively open-minded though, as many of their clan partook in many of the world's slave trades. Yay! This naturally brings us to the colonization of the Americas, as many Toreadors adored the passion and the cultures of this brand new land, popularized by Christopher Columbus, who I'm fairly certain is not kindred. Hmm. Those who didn't make their home in Mississippi fought in the Civil War, either for or against the idea of the US becoming an independent state, and eventually the liberation of slavery. I have always found it odd to believe that Toreadors would ever would be at the forefront of any physical conflict. After all, I didn't think they would want mud or soot to sully their powdered wigs. Ha 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 ha. 
Then I remember there are physical manifestations of passion and thus they will do anything if they feel it in their undead hearts. They may even have the use celerity to move as quickly as possible into that opportunity. The civil war also sparked a short conflict with the Sabbat, as this sparked fires of yesteryear, something I've touched upon during our conversations regarding the Sword of Cain. But what are the anti-tributoriadors like? After all, the ideologies of the Sabbat clash massively with those of the Clan of the Rose of the Camarilla, who try so hard to remain as human as possible. I asked you earlier on how one would define art. What makes art art? Is it the masterful brushstrokes of a painting, the smoothness of a marble statue, the intonation of a violin its fingering and burring, or perhaps is it the screaming agony of a dying malnourished child bestowed to a week's physical torture to see how far one can push the human body? The Toreador anti tribute are the dark mirror image of their Camarilla brethren. Although they are no less beautiful than their Camarilla cousins, their minds are twisted and warped. The anti tribute often lose themselves watching others suffer, much like their Camarilla siblings lose themselves watching a beautiful painting. They must use their willpower to miss up the opportunity to inflict pains upon others. Many Toreadors within the Sabbat who were once mortals were members of the Samitsi Sanatosa Revenant family. Santosas are born with a vicitude discipline, and when embraced as a Toreador, they retain this as a bloodline discipline instead of acquiring celerity of the mainline Toreador, and they retain their familial weakness of hedonistic addiction instead of acquiring the Toreador anti tribute weakness of compulsion towards cruelty, with some being able to combine their presence and vicitude to infuse their own presence into tattoos and body modifications placed upon others, canines and mortal alike, which is just as worrying as it sounds. The reputation of Toreador being perverts is due in part of Sanatosa Toreador. It is fair to assume that since the Victorian period, perhaps just a little bit before then, we are now in the age of the Toreador. Think about how the world has changed since then, with the evolution and the invention of so many art forms, fashion, technology and music. The 20th century in particular experienced new revolutionary ideas and concepts practically every decade. Fashion, art and music charges through at a whirlwind pace now, which is a reflection of who and what they embrace. The most relevant, popular, musically powerful now are the targets chosen to be toyed or chowder, before being dumped because their sigh has quickly moved on to something far more exciting. Their understanding of what is hip can reflect in who is chosen as a city's harpy, which is often a powerful Toreador. When you view a century with such a wide brushstroke, one can have a better understanding of how the Toreador live on a daily basis. I can imagine life must be incredibly overwhelming, sights, smells and sounds just overwhelming the soul. Many kindred partake in the traditions in similar fashions to each other, avoid drawing unwanted attention that could break the masquerade as the most common way we all do it, myself included. We are the wolf within the sheep's clothing, but not really becoming a part of it. Toreadors don't do this. The lines between predator, lover, family and prey are all blurred for the Toreadors. They establish mortal aliases, surrounding themselves with kind as if they are genuine. Some see the more successful of these Toreadors as masters of the art. I see them as fucking stupid and pathetically sad. The beast in their chest is not so much a ravenous call for hunger, but an amplifier, like the best dose of heroin you can get. Not that I would know what that feels like, of course, <laughs> oh no. They cling to their pasts, living through it through waves of bloody nostalgia, a mirage of a romanticised land of what might have been. It makes me sick. In case I haven't milked it enough, the Toreadors are famous and infamous as a clan of artists and innovators. They are one of the bastions of modern kindred society, as their very survival depends on the facades of civility and grace on which it and the Camarilla prides itself. But to say that they are not a powerful clan and just consist of a bunch of artistic airheads would be a most unwise mindset indeed, for beauty is love and love can make anyone do anything. So keep that in mind if you ever want to take your ghoul to Elysium, only to find out they much rather go home with the girl in a tight-fitting dress or the man with a handsome smile, for such smiles lies a sinister past almost as old as Cain himself. 
To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.